Hello and uh, welcome to the theatre at Parliament House Canberra. We meet here today where people have met for thousands of years and so I acknowledge the Gunnawal and Gambri peoples who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respect to the elders past and present of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Thanks for coming along to our first occasional lecture for 2018, 2018. I've got to get into the habit of saying 2018. This is a year of two significant anniversaries. It's the, the 30th anniversary of Parliament House and the 30th anniversary of this Senate lecture series. Both presenters with the opportunity to reflect on the many changes that have taken place in this house over that time. Today's lecturer was here virtually from the beginning. Joining the Parliamentary Press Gallery in October 1988, he spent 11 formative years in uh, Canberra as economics correspondent for News Limited and later features writer for The Australian. After returning to his native Melbourne in 1999, he further forged his career as a senior journalist and Walkley Award winning author. A regular political commentator on television, on radio and online, he has that rare gift of taking events we have all lived through and explaining them in a way that makes us see them anew. Who better then to speak on the changing relationship between the media and the parliament that it observes? It's my great pleasure to welcome Mr George Megalogenis back to his journalistic roots to talk about politics and the media in the digital age. Thank you very much and uh, welcome all. This is a good little turnout and I know people are watching online which is probably a little more intimidating for me because I can't see their faces. Um, interesting bi biographical observation, you missed the um, most important point. Uh, the first page one I wrote after I arrived in Canberra was about the Bogon moth invasion <laughs> of the new Parliament House in 1988. Um, terrible story to be given first up because you couldn't get a, the head count right. Uh, I think in the Melbourne Sun we had 20 million and I think in the Daily Telegraph we had 40 million. Uh, <laughs> but it is what it is. Um, for those of you who obviously have been looking at the uh, overhead projector, I'm not going to uh, get to it just yet, but uh, I want to walk you through then and now uh, just to give you a feel for how the media environment has been uh, disrupted by technology. Now technology is a very, very loose concept because uh, people tend to blame the technology uh, for all the disruption. It's the behaviour of the politics and the behaviour of the media I want to go to uh, post the disruption. But the first thing I want to do, and it's interesting that we're looking at some anniversaries, 30 years for the new Parliament House. The, the new Parliament House for all its charms was the uh, first venue where politicians and journalists were physically separated. So the intimacy of the old house which I had missed because I arrived in October, uh, the old house closed in May of that year. That physical intimacy that existed in those days was forced by the nature of the building and we've all been to the old building and uh, wondered how it was that the press gallery actually lived in that little rabbit warren. Uh, and as you walk through the Prime Minister's office, the Prime Minister's suite, you wonder how it is you got good policy out of that <laughs> space, because it's still pretty cramped in there. When I first got here in 88, uh, again, without any idea of how business was con conducted in the old house, there was a, a good deal of uh, uh, attempts to recreate that environment. Uh, pretty much every minister threw a corridor party, and then they threw another one, and then they threw another one. Uh, John Howard in those days was notorious, he was the best thrower of uh, office parties and all and sundry in the building were invited. Some of you might have been around for some of the early ones and it felt like to me looking back that they were trying to hang on to some of the informality that existed in the old house. Now when I talk about technology, the thing that was changing even as we got here to the new house was the disruption of television. Television in the 80s was a very, very big part of the way politics uh, was communicated to the public at large. Uh, the current affairs television in those days was very, very uh, learned compared to its, t its iteration today. But I just sort of want to mention that as a by and by, I think the behaviour of this building versus the behaviour of the old building is something to consider in a structural sense as well as 
the people who walk through this place. Now the other two anniversaries I want to just note, 1993, 25th anniversary of the uh, True Believers election, which Labor won against the odds, and 1998, which is the 20th anniversary of the GST election that a government uh, did win. Well, the opposition put the GST in question in 93, but the government did put the question again in 1998 and won that election. Now, depending on your perspective, either the world changed in 93 where, when Keating ran a scare campaign against John Hewson's fight back, or it was going to change after 1998 when John Howard, just by the skin of his teeth, uh, is re-elected, even though he lost the popular vote, took another couple of years to implement the GST, and then the political system said after that, we can't do big reform anymore. Now, there's a bit of truth in both observations, because people on the Liberal side will tell you that the scare campaign gave in 93 that Keating ran gave both sides of politics permission to be more negative. Up until that point, and there have been negative uh, scare campaigns in the past, most of them in the foreign affairs space, but up until that point it was, it was rare for a political party to devote all its communication to the people to saying that the other side is about to rip you off and without offering an alternative. I think it's a little unfair of Keating because he did offer a, some pretty big alternatives in 1993. But both sides of politics took their takeout lesson from the 93 election was, I can just be negative and I can win. And I can win when I've got nothing else to say. And the reason why I mention that is, as the question mark about whether this is the starting point of the disruption is a couple of other things were happening at that point which are now much more obvious with the benefit of hindsight. That election campaign, uh, which pretty much was a year-long election campaign after Keating had taken the leadership from Bob Hawke at the end of 1991, all through 1992, there is this thing called News Poll, which went from a monthly survey to a fortnightly survey. And I actually think that that's the first step into the abyss for the political system, the modern abyss that we're in now. Uh, when News Poll went fortnightly, the very first thing that changed in the behaviour of politics, now leave to one side how journos behaved when they felt that they had to report news poll and not policy. The first thing that happened on the, in the political sphere is a political party, and this was the Liberal Party between the 1993 and 1996 elections, i.e. in that parliamentary term, had three leaders. John Hewson, Alexander Downer, and then John Howard. Now, the first two were punted because the polls told them that they weren't going to win the next election. The polls didn't actually say that, but that was what the backbench thought. And so Alexander Downer is the first main party leader in our political history that didn't actually get to contest an election. So I think that's the first disruption that we need to keep in our heads uh, when, we, when we consider what's not working today. And that is the interruption, and this is way before the internet, this is way before the televising of Parliament, although we we're about to get into the televising of Parliament at this point because it happened in the 90s. The very first disruption is that the opinion poll became news. And that um, is something I think, uh, those of you who followed my work in the media, it's something I regretted for a long time and I went on a poll ban. Uh, first it was only going to last for a year and now it's basically the rest of my career. I try not to mention them, even though I'm obviously mentioning them today. Now, what I'd like to do is show you the front page of the 1998 tax package, if I can do this properly. Here we go. And the camera, for those of you who are watching who are not in the room, was obviously now going to switch to the front page. So I'm going to walk up to it and just give you an idea of what that front page tells us about how politics was conducted in those days. Now, the thing to remember is that the GST was being discussed by this government, the Howard government, for a full year before we saw the package. So for that year before the package was released, there was a lot of work went into identifying problems in the old system that the government wanted to fix. So that's one year's worth of preparation before the release of this document. Now, the document itself, in fact, we were so, we were so over it before it came out, I prepared this lift out, so I've got a fair idea of the structure of this document uh, that the Australian produced for its readers the next day. The main story is as straight a news report as you can get. 
the first 14 paragraphs, and I'll double check it, but the first 14 the first 12 paragraphs, sorry, are uh, just a recitation of what the package will mean for individuals. The first person quoted in the piece is John Howard, but he's quoted in the 14th paragraph. Kim Beasley gets a line towards the end before the main story spills into uh, the next page. Those nine case studies we have on the front page are people from the real world who we'd set up weeks in advance to take a question from us on the night that the package was released, which basically, broke, which basically told them what they were going to get and what they were going to lose, and we got a, got a two-line two response from each of them. We'd already interviewed them about their lives and about their expectations for the package. So that's the headline on the front page. All the way through the paper, we had each of those case studies representing a certain part of the constituency that was going to be affected by this package. Now, the reason why I'm going through the detail of this is just imagine how much work would have gone into it at our end, in a sense, to honour the work. Now, I don't mean honour in the sense that we uh, wanted to barrack for one side or the other, but to honour the work that a government had already put into it. There's a, uh, a second news story which Richard McGregor has uh, written, and that story basically breaks out the deal that the GST would be, the revenue from the GST would go to the states. Paul Kelly has got an analysis down the bottom of the front page. We've got some pictures up the top, including my ugly little head in the top right hand corner, pointing to our analysis inside. Now, the critical thing about this, pack, uh, about this lift out is that on each page, I was able to, in advance, get someone from each part of the Australian society, whether it was business, community organisation, tax expert, and set them up to write analysis. Now, it's a very important word, analysis. They're all in the body of this work and were able to tell you, as a reader, what their take on the GST was. Now, the only other thing in journalism today that has that level of detail is the budget lift out. And the budget lift out sort of produces that level of detail almost by default because they lock you up in a room for six hours and you've got 20 or 30 journos in the room who, as battery hens, just produce all the copy that they can. The other thing is when a budget is released, the government still feels obliged to, to give you the balance sheet, what you gain and what you lose. Now, that's 1998. Now, there's only a fortnight before the election was called, but after the election was run and won by the government, there was another seven or eight months negotiating with the Senate. Now, in the negotiation with the Senate, there are committee inquiries. So we were at, even though Labor might have argued that the electorate only had two weeks to absorb the GST, the system had a long time to absorb the GST before it legislated. Now, the first iteration of the debate, and remember we're in anniversary territory, 25 years, so 24 years ago, <laughs> Brian Harradine finally told John Howard he wasn't going to pass the package in the form that was presented to the voters. He didn't want food in. So John Howard, after a couple of days, said, well, I'll talk to Meg Lees and the Democrats and I'll get food out. Then after implementation, by the way, there was another year, another year, I think you probably all know where I'm going with this stuff. This is, this is a long time to digest a package. Another year's worth of implementation stories. So on the first anniversary of the GST, not that I'm going to bore you with the front page, um, we did a go back to the field report on what was the impact of the thing a year later. Now, anyone remember that? This is the snapshot of the mining tax package released in 2010. This is the front page of The Australian, 12 years after the GST front page. Don't be bedazzled by the colour, obviously it's high quality paper. Um, now, the mining tax, for those of you who might remember, had no run up. It was basically dropped on the electorate without warning. There was a 1500 word document called the Henry Tax Review, which had been prepared which was dumped on the same day that the mining tax was released. There was almost no ability for someone like me to prepare case studies. Think it's, just think this thing through about the capacity constraint the journal has now. When a government dumps 1,500 pages worth of very rich material analysing the tax system, but has decided to, to junk the report, releases a small bit of paper that says, here are the six things we're going to do. And the big one is we're going to tax the mining sector with a super profits tax. 
So how do you, as a newspaper, react to that reporting challenge? A big pile of paper gets thrown at you with a couple of hours to digest. Now, unfortunately, we did a pretty good job, but we didn't do the job we could have done, and we certainly didn't do the job we did in 1998. Now, the first couple of paragraphs of the main story read almost identically to the first couple of paragraphs of the story we wrote in 1998. Kevin Rudd has sweetened his re-election pitch with a plan to boost employer superannuation contribution by 12% and milk the mining boom with a $10 billion super profits tax. In fact, it's a sharper uh, lead than we had in 1998. Second, second paragraph tells you that he's junked the Henry Review. Now guess who the first person we quoted was? Was it Kevin Rudd, Wayne Swan, or Tony Abbott? Six paragraphs in, we quote Tony Abbott saying, this is not a plan to grow the economy, this is Kevin Rudd's plan to kill the mining boom. Bang. That's the first active voice you read in that story. The first active voice you read in the story in 1998, I'll just flick you back, is way down the end of that first column. The first active voice is actually the most prominent thing you'll see in the 2010 copy. Why did we react to it politically? One of the reasons why we reacted to it politically as a paper is that the story had already moved on. That day, that Sunday, when we were in the lockup for the uh, mining tax, everybody scurried out of the lockup and did their Sky News report or did their um, ABC News report or tweeted. I mean, it's still early days for Twitter. Everybody barreled out of that room and had already started to interpret the thing politically. So your next day's paper could only think politically. Now, if I were editor, I might have tried to do something different, but I'm not sure how different it would have looked. Now, here's another couple of things to think about. Two comment pieces on the front, not one. An inside story, which we prepared uh, in advance. Within the body of the paper, we didn't have thoughtful analysis pieces by affected parties. We had about half a dozen knee-jerk comment pieces. Now, it's easy for people to look at that paper and say, this is a once over easy effort. One of the reasons why the paper could only do this, and I think it did pretty well at the time, is because politics didn't give us time to digest the package. Now, the mining tax was very popular, but it was dead on arrival for another reason. The first thing the public hear about it is the opposition to it. Now, everybody on the Labor side understands the lesson from this period, but when I show you these two things, we're looking at two different worlds. Sorry if I flicked through too fast. 98, thoughtful analysis, a year's worth of preparation, and knowing there's going to be another year or so of debate before this thing is finally in your pocket or it comes out of your pocket. 2010, hit and run. Now, the other part of the hit and run, on the bottom of page two, you can't see it there, there is actually a little list of where you could see all your favourite journalists from the Oz. Paul Kelly will appear here, here and here. Dennis Shanahan will appear there. And there's a little line in there for me saying, I will be live blogging at midday on the Monday, which I was. Um, for the life of me, I can't imagine how it is that I could have got my head around the thing on the day when the next thing I had to do was to answer questions from readers. Uh, it's the speed of the change that basically talked me out of journalism from that point on. This was the year, and I'll be very honest with this room, <laughs> this was the year, and the people watching, this was the year where I felt daily journalism had got too quick for a boring policy-focused journalist like myself. The election campaign that year, 2010, was the first election campaign where a story you would break would not get followed up by your colleagues. Not because it wasn't a good story, but and a couple of mates of mine did ring me after one particular piece I wrote and said, love your story, mate, but I'm sorry, we can't follow it up because the bus has taken us out here and then, you know, Mark Latham is about to monster Julia Gillard somewhere and Tony Abbott's hiding away because he's 20 points clear in the polls. Um, it almost became impossible to be a thoughtful journalist in this world. Now, the disruptions between 98 and 2010, remember, I'm just taking some snapshots here. Now, I'll take it off so we're not totally distracted by Ken Henry's sigh in that picture. <laughs> the big disruption in between 
and this is the biggest disruption. It's not Newspoll. Newspoll is the first. The biggest disruption in between is the digital revolution. And the disruption that the digital technology has brought to our public debate is you sort of feel it in, in all the static that's around. But I'll take you two steps back. I'm going to try and put myself in the shoes of a politician. I see this thing called social media and I see this guy, George M, for argument's sake, who's always asking me these terrible nitpicky questions about the impact of this or this line of this package. And I'm sick of talking to him because I can get my message out immediately to the people who I need to persuade via social media. Now, that language of Tony Abbott opposing the mining tax, that language had been fashioned. And he'd only been opposition leader for about six months at that point. That language had been fashioned in that digital world. That would have fitted on a tweet. That would have, uh, that would have got you the top line of the uh, television news bulletin that night. And television news had contracted, well, I mean contracted, it had shrunk the airtime it gave to national affairs to basically a soundbite of that length. But the other thing is the politician who delivers a package like that, Kevin Rudd, had already been operating in that world for about two or three years. So when you think about the digital disruption, in the first instance, Kevin Rudd looked like the world's perfect adapter of the digital age. And he was a year before Barack Obama, by the way. In 2007, in that very long election campaign, now let's compare the 2007 election campaign to the 98 election campaign, all through 98, we're trying to figure out the impact of the GST on this or that. All the way through 2007, we're trying to stop Kevin Rudd long enough to ask him a question. <laughs> and of course, he won't take a question from us, us, whatever us means in the press gallery, um, because he can go on FM radio, he can, he can go on social media, he can go on Rove McManus, and then get put the question about who he'd turn gay for. Now, John Howard, the thing that really annoyed John Howard about 2007 was that Kevin Rudd did not have two bad days in a row. As a campaigner, it was the first time in his public life that an opponent did not have two bad days in the media in a row. And if you don't have two bad days in the media in a row, the other side can't get their hooks into you. He was so quick and he was so intuitive in his adaptation to this new media that it looked like all the rules had been rewritten. Now, there's a couple of politicians who had used media in the past to basically jump traditional containment lines, not just press gallery, but also their party rooms, to make a case to the public to elect them. Robert Menzies with Talkback Radio is the first, most famous example uh, political academics will cite. Now, it took him a long time in those days to remake himself. He was the Prime Minister who couldn't hold his government together during a war. Um, but by 42, he's issuing these sermons to middle Australia about the forgotten people. Sermons that by 1949 have him elected at the top of a boom, by the way. So Labor, Labor loses power at the top of a boom to a guy who's going to be Prime Minister for the next 16 years. Now, the next one after Menzies, and this is radio, the next one after Menzies, to my mind, and he did something that I, before or since I haven't seen outside of Donald Trump, is a guy called Bob Hawke, who as ACTU president basically jumped every traditional containment line via television. So whereas Menzies is this comforting voice in your lounge room coming through the wireless, this man is in your home, and it's the first time you've heard a politician speak to you like this. He's, I mean, he's still doing public rallies, he's still doing all the other things he needs to do, he's still taking questions from the regular press, but he's got into middle Australia via another means, and he's the first one to do it. Ben Sheffley couldn't do it because apparently he had a really awful voice for radio. When Bob Hort turned up in the 70s, and this is television's first big disruption, he was ACTU president, and in the past no one had known what an ACTU president was, these old blokes were in cardigans. And suddenly <laughs> there is this guy who's in your living room and fighting for your side if you're a Labor voter. And if you were a Conservative voter, he showed you this other side of him, which is that he also liked to cut deals and he understood business. And so this guy was able to, even though he had very little support in the early days in the Labor Party caucus, make himself an alternate Prime Minister by about 1974 or 1975. Radio, television. 
The difference with social media, the difference with social media when you do that disruption, when you sort of grab a political system from the outside as a Rudd did or later an Obama or then subsequently Donald Trump, is that it's just as easy to use that system to stop stuff from happening. So what Menzies and Hawke were able to do through radio and television in a world where we still operated at the pace of that 1998 lift out, what they were able to do is gain attention, but the system still worked the way it always worked. Public service gave advice, government prepared the ground for a big policy reform, government sold its case to the people, uh, government took questions from the media. In the social media age, the temptation to avoid all those other things um, was overwhelming. And as I say, if I were in Kevin Rudd's shoes or involved in John Howard's shoes by the end of it, and I thought that I could avoid taking a question from someone like me as a journalist, I would probably take up that opportunity for a year or two. But, and this is the big but, if I then saw the main party vote, which had been reliably 40% when we got kicked out of government and 50% when we entered government start to leak. Now the two parties used to rely on 80 or 90% of the Australian population, closer to 90% than 80%, to turn up for them pretty much every time an election was held. So the contest was in and around that last 10%. Half of it probably wasn't paying attention and the other half were active swinging voters. Now when you're pitching to that 5%, uh, social media isn't the most logical thing to do to them because they're going to weigh their vote. So you will slow down your communication with them to make sure that you've persuaded them. It's how the system operated for as long as anyone could remember. Once the language of politics changed, and this is the thing I'm still trying to get my head around, there's obviously a cohort effect occurring here. There's a group of politicians who have arrived in this world and have known no other world. But once the language of politics changed, once all the other big disruptions were coming, not just the technological ones, but you think about the world pre and post the GFC in Australia, the 2007 election is the last normal election in Australia. It is the last election where the main parties were the main event. 2010, 13 and 16, we've seen the combined primary vote of the two main parties go into free fall. Now free fall only needs to be 10 percentage points. You only need 10 percent to come off the two parties to go from that pile to the independents to have a US style disruption to your political system. Because when you go to work, even the day after you get elected, you've only got about a third of the electorate committed to you and two thirds ready to dump you almost immediately. Now in that world, and this is the world a lot of politicians have been operating in the last 10 or so years, this is the world obviously where a government thinks it can drop a mining tax policy on you and expect to have it passed within a week. In that world, why do you think they're struggling to get their message out? Now, this is the most complicated bit of the story for me because I'm now trying to ask people in public life to take the media on trust again. Now, if I took a survey today of this room, Trust in Parliament, presumably it's where everybody would expect it to be, pretty low. Trust in media, you'd expect it to be pretty low. Trust in the public service, you'd hope is still pretty high, but there'd be a question mark because of, the, because of outside forces. Trust in something like the ABC, you'd think it'd still be pretty high, but question mark again for the ABC. Now, I'm pausing here because I make sure I don't trip myself up, but I probably should continue uh, a stream of consciousness, which is not what this speech is about, it's actually quite a structured speech. <laughs> but when I, think about, when I think about how would you restore respect to Parliament, I don't think you can restore respect to Parliament until politics treats the media with respect again. Now this is a very difficult, this is a very difficult thing to explain to a politician, not because they are difficult people, um, it's just very difficult in this environment to get them to trust what it is I'm about to suggest to them. To, to trust that, it, that it's in their short term interest. I actually don't think it's in the interest of any individual to do what I'm about to suggest. But I think one of the reasons why our two parties are as on the nose as they are is that the conversations that were already apparent 
And I'm going to remind you of these things. The conversation that was already apparent by 2010 was that sped up, here's a big pile of paper, digest it, oh hang on, someone's just said no, all right, I'll drop it. That world, in that world, politicians are asking the people to process information faster than is humanly possible. Now, public engagement in politics hasn't changed. People are still interested in politics when they are properly aroused, i.e. when the brain is going. They can pick things very quickly though, because most of the time they want to be left alone. So because I've been living outside of the bubble now for a few years, I can tell you the two things that went completely off the radar and conversations, say, at cafes and with neighbours would become intensely political for two seconds before we return back to real issues like the footy, was um, Roland Bishop's helicopter. <laughs> and <clears throat> I wasn't going to mention him, Barnaby Joyce. So in the last five years since I've been out of the daily, well, the last six years now since I've been at da daily media, they're the things I hear from people who never discuss politics. They're the only two things. And that was about a sense of entitlement. The thing is, when you talk to them about issues, though, um, they have all the time in the world to talk to you about the school, the local school, or about the council trying to repave the road and mucking it all up, or whatever it is that we talk about. Now, most of the political parties have been told this, and they've been told this repetitively. If you can find an issue that the electorate is already engaged in, and you can slow your conversation down and talk to them about it, they'll respect you for it. But in this souped up media environment, it's very difficult for one side or the other to take that leap of faith. Now, as I said, what I'm trying to propose here is something else. What I'm trying to propose here is that politics find a way to resubmit to scrutiny from media. Now, I just saw the other day, uh, Chris Bowen tried to explain the superannuation changes that the Labor Party have just announced to Lee Sales on the 7.30 report. A brilliant interview from Lee. Uh, interesting performance from Chris Bowen. Uh, she asked him very specific questions, the sorts of questions that you would have seen answered in that 1998 lift out. She asked him very specific questions about who was affected. He replied with a very broad number and then didn't want to engage in the detail. Now, this is not about Chris Bowen, by the way, this observation. When I saw that, I thought, you haven't had enough exposure as a politician to that sort of questioning. Because for a minute there, he looked a little flummoxed. Now, it's, this is not a Labor-specific observation. I can make that observation about pretty much any politician across the board. The willingness to submit yourself to an interview from somebody who is not on your side uh, requires not just confidence in your own message, but also an understanding that the system relies on that dialogue to be able to then make deeper connections to the electorate. How do we know this? Well, we know this because in the past, when the two parties had, you know, closer to 90% of the primary vote but locked up between them, leaders on both sides, leaders, opposition leaders, treasurers, shadow treasurers, would sit down in this building and take all questions for an hour and a half. Now, that would be terribly boring on Sky if you ran an hour and a half press conference. But we would come out of those press conferences with about five or six stories. The other thing is, and I've compared, uh, not, as I said, I'm trying not to get too personal here. If you compare the answers that were given by a Keating or a Howard, say, even in the 90s, to very, very combative but direct questions from the press gallery, these things are, are quotable at length in a newspaper or in a book. If you think about the equivalent press conference now, now remember how the thing is set up. Firstly, there might be 10 or 20 journos out there. So if there are 10 or 20 journos there, there should be 30 Australian flags <laughs> behind the leader. I've just made that up. It's obviously not 30, but I think we went close one day, didn't we? <laughs> so leader's got to project total confidence. Journo asks a hard question, leader has to belt journo. Of course, it was ever thus. Journo asks another hard question, leader says, right, I've got a zip. True story. In the 80s, the 90s, and I'm not suggesting these are glory days, but in the 80s and 90s, they still hadn't been tempted with this idea that they could avoid us completely. They still hadn't had the digital temptation. They'd been 
temptations of television and radio, but the engagement was still mediated by press gallery. Now, of course, to put them back in that room when they're not ready for that conversation would make for the most diabolical viewing for the politician. But, and this is again the big but, I think they'd be better for it in the long run. Now John Howard, and I, I will personalise this, John Howard was very good at staying in touch with journos in this building who were always giving him a hard time. He thought it kept him match fit to take their questions. He went on talkback radio not to, not to arouse an audience so much as to prove that he could take any question from talkback. He viewed these things as tests of temperament. Now, today, and it's been the case now for about the last 10 or so years, most people in this building would want to know how a, a journo votes, even though they'll tell you they don't. They want to know which way a journo leads. Most journos don't want to be forced to choose. One or two may have in this building, but I don't think too many in this building have. But outside this building, there are a lot of journalists prepared, more commentators than journalists, prepared to pick a team. Why is that? Now, it might be easy to gain access that way, but really, why is that? I think part of the reason is, once a politician had left this mediated space of the press gallery to be interrogated, and wanted to talk directly to the people, some journalists decided to go where the audience was and followed the politician down that tunnel. I don't think it's a good place for journalists to be, by the way. Obviously, I'm making this point. I'm reiterating this point. But I think a, there was a structural temptation. We've had the experiment, and it's not working. Now, how do you fix it? I know I keep posing this question, and I'm sort of waiting, not for a flash of inspiration, but I'm sort of just waiting for the moment where I want to say the most controversial thing. The most disturbing thing about public life today in relationship between media and politics is the idea on both sides that when you get into government, the communications minister and even the prime minister runs the ABC. Now I think that is, in terms of the, the last thing you would want to do uh, for national interest, contesting your national broadcaster's right to exist to politicise it to the extent it's been politicised by both sides over the last 10 or 15 years, is almost the last step into the abyss. And when I'm suggesting a solution, this isn't so much a solution, it is a, it is a warning. Don't follow this particular thought to its illogical conclusion, which is that the ABC is so totally terrified of politics that it second guesses the thoughts of the government of the day. Now, it is, see, no case studies. I'm not going to give you any case studies on the ABC, but I can tell you for a fact, because I'm quite well aware of a lot of the goings on behind the scenes in the political sphere, both sides, both sides for the last 10 or 15 years have yielded to their temptation to micromanage the ABC. Now, Hawke and Keating and Howard were at war with the ABC in the past. It's never been thus with the ABC, but there was still in that world and understanding that there were some separations of power. Now the temptation, because the ABC is the last big audience in the media, and because the ABC is the last media institution that is respected, the temptation to try and co-opt that to a political purpose is manifest in the political system. So first temptation, go down the rabbit hole of uh, digital media. That hasn't worked. Hang on a minute. This thing is still, is still viable. I'll latch onto that. Now the idea, I, for the life of me, can't understand why ministers, plural, across both sides of politics, would be contesting panellists on Q&A, would waste the next day after a Q&A episode arguing the toss over a question that got asked in the room. For the life of me, I can't understand why you would devote that much energy to that, to that um, particular issue, whatever the issue of the day is. I do know why, and it's not a corrupt intent. It is just an attempt to control what's left. Because everything else doesn't actually add up at the moment for people in public life. The best ideas are disposed of almost immediately on contact with the public or on contact with the media. So there is, um, there is a fair bit to worry about, but there is an institution that we still have in Australia that if 
it is respected, may well give us a chance, once all this thing has settled down in the digital age, to restore some new version, some 21st version of that, you know, in both media and politics interest to have a much more robust relationship. Now remember, I think the primary point, and this is the primary takeout, so there's no politicians in this room, but this is the primary takeout for the politician. Your public language will improve if you take questions from people who are trying to make your life harder. Your public language actually does improve. At the moment, too many people in public life will only do the interview with who the person they think is it's not going to give them a hard time. Whether they're on site or not, let's not worry about that. It's not going to give them a hard time. That micro-communication to what you imagine is your base is, doesn't get you back to 50% primary on, at an election campaign and on entry to government. Now Labor, weirdly, at the last federal election, almost won the election with a primary vote in the mid-30s. Now could you imagine how volatile that situation would be for any side of politics to come into power with a primary vote in the mid-30s? Now that primary vote will stay in the mid-30s for both sides if you go on Sky or if you go on the ABC thinking that you're going to get a good, uh, a, a sort of a good run. The people who are watching, not just the ABC, but the people who are sort of consuming politics at whichever speed they're consuming it today, can be turned into a 40 or a 50 or a 60 or a 70 percent on an issue. Now the same-sex marriage vote last year tells you that there's a super majority on some social reforms. That's plus 60, and that's a majority in every state. So the public is not as negative, I think, as maybe politics has uh, interpreted it. So there, it is possible to build these big majorities, but I think to build a majority like that, you have to view the Australian people in the way that was viewed in the past, as a coalition of interests, and you had to build a big coalition to be able to win. Now, I just want to leave at that and give you a chance for some questions, because uh, I haven't so much gone off script, but I've adjusted it for the, uh, for the alleged controversy of telling politicians to leave the ABC alone. Uh, as I say, have a good look, if you're in public life, have a good look at the way press conferences were conducted in the past. They're very scratchy. They were long-winded, the questions. And none of us, none of us had, uh, had media training. We were print people and we'd be yelling over each other to get the Treasurer's ear or the Prime Minister's ear. But every time a question like that would come, there was almost, and this is a systems-wide obligation, people felt an obligation to answer it at length. Now the cycle was sped up, but the public were able to consume that information then. So even though the cycle was sped up, wouldn't you be looking for some way to recreate that deeper conversation? As I say, I think those conversations, even if you have them in, in, uh, in sharper sentences today and they're a much uh, sort of slicker media presentation, the language of that conversation will improve if your ideas are contested. So, as I say, I'm not saying lay off the ABC. I'm saying, by all means, go to war with them. But go to war with them on your idea. Don't go to war with them on them disagreeing with you. Go to war with them in the normal combat in the idea space prepared to take the questions, knowing that that audience is going to listen to you if you give them a decent answer. Anyway, I'll leave it at that, uh, and uh, maybe we'll take some questions from the audience. And thank you also to the people who are watching. Thank you, George. Nothing uh, controversial there, so um, I'm not sure that we'll have any questions, but uh, we, we do have microphones on either side of the, um, of the auditorium if, uh, if people do want to um, ask some questions. We don't seem to have anyone rushing towards it. Gentlemen here, if you speak loudly, I'm sure we'll record it. I go to the 2020 summer, which um, uh, Prime Minister Rudd announced, set up, and I think about, and I, and I was a public servant, but I was involved in it, but the cynicism with which that was treated in the run-up to it, 
during it and after it. When, um, when you, we all say it would be lovely to have a debate and speculate about ideas and discuss all the options that might be available about climate change or whatever. That was treated like terribly badly. Um, so I think we're wishing and hoping versus reality because that was that was just so badly done. Uh, by but perhaps you know you'll blame the way it was done by the government of the day, but but I actually think the media and the commentators ruined that as well. So look, I that's actually a very good example. So what you're really looking at there is a not just a time and place, but a, a very very cynical public mood. It was also just before the GFC. So we were in, we were in uh, I think, a time and place then where people thought the government was just there to write a cheque for them. And I, I do understand that Kevin Rudd wanted to reset that debate with the 2020 summit. Now, I think the conduct, I mean, I think he should have just kept coming back. He did move very quickly from the 2020 summit. In fact, I remember the weekend that the 2020 summit was hosted there were three announcements that week on completely different matters. Three announcements through that week. Um, that, in fact, that was literally, you know, you're describing the week where I called him our first federal premier in print, sadly, um, for me. <laughs> um, it, that's not the public mood now. Now, how do I know this? Uh, I've been spending a lot of time uh, researching a couple of other ideas. Uh, I, I, but because I'm in, on deadline now, I don't want to. I don't want to waste <laughs> waste your time by giving you the thesis. But people and con I'll, I'll start. I'll start at the most basic level: consumer behaviour. Now, uh, consumers have actually moved off the 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 I, what's in it for me, to sense of purpose. It's a very strange. It's a very strange world we're moving into. Marketers will tell you this: that people are now starting to think about community. So people are more likely to buy things now that make them feel good about themselves as opposed to buy things that have been sold to them. So the people who used to, who used to think about self accepted the cynicism of the market transaction. Now they're over the cynicism and are looking to, to reconnect in some other way. So I think the electorate is probably uh, more ready now than it was then. The other thing I'll remind you is coming out of that summit uh, was the one thing that did stick, which was the National Disability Insurance Scheme. Now, the National Disability Insurance Scheme is almost the counter example to everything else that's been tried in the last 20 years. Uh, now, if I can very quickly summarise one of the other things that concerns me about politics today is that an incoming government feels its first three years in office is about erasing the last three years. Now you've just had a you've just had a um, a, a, a yes no referendum on a light rail in the ACT. Victoria, we're about to have our second election, which is roads versus rail. And knowing that the side that that wins is going to undo whatever else the other side had done. Now a, a contract to build a road in Victoria was cancelled, and a billion dollars was paid to the contractor for not actually doing a day's work. So in that world. So this is our politics, this is how politics is behaving today. In that world, I think it is possible to go back to where Kevin thought we could be in 2008. One other thing to remember, what went wrong in 2009? Funnily enough, we might be having a different debate if the climate change package had been landed in 2009 with the Labor and Liberal parties agreeing. Rudd was trying to destroy Turnbull at the same time he was negotiating. That's the first point. Most people acknowledge that. Kevin Rudd's acknowledged this publicly. When the Liberals switched to Tony Abbott and the deal was off, he didn't take option two, plan B, which was to go to the Greens. So the thing crashed and burned. He had enough votes in the Senate to pass the thing with a couple of Liberals crossing the floor. And that would have been the most powerful statement that could have been made at the time in politics. That the party that went off the reservation on climate change could still get, couldn't stop something because a couple of people of conscience on their side crossed the floor. Now, it might have been possible that something like that might have happened in 98 with a couple of Labor people cross the floor to let the GST pass. It's possible. When that didn't happen, of course, we've ended up where we've ended up today. But just because your last 10 years hasn't been normal doesn't mean the next 10 years has to be like the last 10 years. It's probably the long way of putting the answer to that question. Do you have other questions? We've got the microphone here. 
just on, on this side, I think, Ruth, we've got a gentleman. Thanks very much, George, for uh, a really enlightening presentation about uh, how things have moved. And I was particularly interested in your comment that we ought to try and move parliamentarians, politicians, from the instant grab to uh, social media to a longer analysis. And what really reinforced for me was the thought that our wonderful ACT Chief Minister has just come out very strongly and said he hates the journalists and he doesn't want anything to do with them. He had to retract that a bit because we didn't like him saying that. But uh, he still come out and said, for the very reason that you've outlined, that he wants to go to other media. And my guess for exactly the reason you've described, it's quicker to get out to people mm. the message that you want to get out. OK, given that scenario, and he's not backing down from not talking to journalists very much, how do we change politicians to help them understand that there's another way of doing things? It doesn't seem to me this is an easy task. It's not to say it's not an important task, but I, apart from saying this is useful to happen, how do we get there? Yes, yeah, so that's a good question because the, obviously the, I'm talking about politics and the media, but the most important part of this story is still the public. And so how do people with uh, goodwill shake politics? Well, in the first instance, they're doing it anyway because they run a revolving door of government. And so we're turning governments over more quickly now, which is a sign of systems trouble. So in a democratic sense, the people are already doing the first thing. But the, but the more in, in interesting issue is how does a, does, a public, how does a public sphere pull rank, in a sense, on politics and slow them down and get them to talk about their issues? Uh, this is a very good question because I'm finding, again, because I'm researching something else at the moment, I'm finding that people are trying to do this, but they're doing it in, the, in, in a way that actually doesn't help us in the short term. They're opting out of politics and trying to do good elsewhere. So uh, just a quick headline, and this is a very interesting headline if you think it through. Um, at the moment now, uh, people are more likely to want to belong to a sporting association, a sporting club, than they are to join a trade union than they are to go to church, and certainly than they are to uh, join a political party. Now, unfortunately, if sport's your default institution, then the game is already up, so to speak, isn't it? Um, so there is, there is this sense, there is this sense that um, it's not so much that there are solutions out there, but there is a willing audience. And I think I was alluding to that earlier. Now, without trying to micromanage the ABC, I'm telling politicians, not to, so an ex journal shouldn't be micromanaging the ABC either. But maybe the ABC might want to go on strike and not take a politician for a week and see what happens. And see what happens when they open up the public space to people of goodwill. People who know stuff about specific issues. And people who, because they're not trained in media, are going to talk to you in a fresh way. So that might be, that might be just a trial balloon for a week. Now, there was a Four Corners just two weeks ago. Uh, Michael Brisson's on climate change did not have a politician. And I don't know if anyone hasn't watched that yet. Please catch up with it because it was very refreshing not to hear a party line because it would have wasted a minute or two of that. What was otherwise, it was a brilliant program. Got another question to stand here. Yes, thank you very much for your presentation. I want to take us from the national to the international and do the influences that you're describing apply internationally? And related to that, can we learn anything from any examples happening around the world today? Yeah, I think, I think every Western democratic system has been disrupted in, in similar ways. Uh, I don't want to pretend to be an expert in any of the individual systems, uh, but I'll make two observations over the last 10 years or so. It is possible for politicians to rise in in a, in a blink of a tweet. It's also possible for a politician, when they're given equal status to main party leaders, to suddenly get a surge in their vote. Now, um, there was the 2010 British election where suddenly the Liberal Democrats were, uh, were front of mind because the three leaders had a debate together. So the guy that they hadn't heard of suddenly has a 20% primary vote. Well, not technically 20%, but there was a big surge. And of course, the party was dead after three years. Well, dead after five years, because their vote collapsed in 2015. So it's possible to gain attention quickly. Now, at the moment, 
that it's the temptations everywhere because you can gain attention quickly. Now in these systems, uh, and one thing you, you can say certainly post-Trump, pretty much every other jurisdiction that's had a national election has gone for a very handsome young man for whatever reason, as a sort of counterpoint to Trump. <laughs> Trudeau or Macron, right? Um, I do have a handsome man theory of politics and that is that the disruptor only works the once against a woman, unfortunately. And that, you know, there's a lot of psychological reasons, I think, in some older electorates uh, about having women in power, which is very, very unfortunate. Um, so whereas you might get a disruptive figure stopping a woman from getting national office, the guy that comes after him tends to be, because the public are then reprojecting back for some sense of normalcy, and they ended up going for somebody younger. Now, in all these systems, and, and it's sort of less possible to do it overseas than you can in Australia. You can do it in Australia under a compulsory voting system. The big switch you get in Australia is when you energise voters under 35. That, they're the big switches. They're the big profound switches where majorities become possible again. And we've only had one of those in the last 20 years in 2007 with Kevin 07. Now, you do see post the Brexit vote a big concern in the British political system about how a lot of young people didn't turn up for that plebiscite. It was only a plebiscite, but they ended up leaving the EU anyway. Um, or planning to anyway. They haven't gone yet. But um, so there is, and I, I hope it's a democratic survival instinct, and it says deep engagement with young people, deep engagement with young people, which means that after I got them the first time to get me into power, I find a way to hang on to power via them. And I think you would have big changes in a lot of the debates we're having now if you, could, if you could activate a larger portion of the electorate than has been activated now. As I said, the reason why I mentioned overseas is there's a couple of cases where you do see that sort of, oh, thank God, it looks like a normal person has just presented, I'll give, him, I'll give him majority. What happens next is probably the test case that we're more interested in. How does Canada govern? How does France govern with, uh, 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 at the moment, activated youth vote? One more question down the front. I think that'll be the last one we've got time for. Uh, thanks, George. I'm sorry that there hasn't been a woman who's been able to ask a question, but um, you talked about respect, particularly politicians learning to respect the work of journalists, and then conversely, journalists growing more respect yep. um, for politicians. I think you've left the important bit out, and that's the public. Um, one of the things that uh, I hear a lot on, on my use of social media is that the public doesn't trust journalists anymore. One of the, the examples that you alluded to that's come up many times recently is that um, why, did anybody, why did anybody keep bothering to talk to Barnaby Joyce once it was clear okay. that he'd done what he'd done? Like, where was them showing the public that they could be respected as journalists by saying, I'm sorry, Barnaby, you're a dropkick, go away, you know? So do you have any comments on the, the public getting respect for journalism and, and noting that respect is something that you have to build up, particularly once you've lost I it, it doesn't just happen. Yeah, I didn't mention the public, but they're front of mind for me. But I'd, I don't want journalists to pitch directly to public because I don't think that that's the role of journalism because then you have a, a, a totally conflicted system then. Then you have journalists not acting as um, as, uh, as sort of filters of information and translators of information, you have an alternate power centre. And I think maybe what the public is already sensing is that, and this is an Australian system we're operating here, where you, you, you tend to expect your journalists not to pick a team, that if a fraction of them have picked a team, then that leads to total collapse in trust. Another fraction, because they don't know how to, um, how to, how to get people to engage with deep fall for journalism, uh, just going to do the, you know, the show trial of celebrity. Um, so maybe that's what the public are noticing. The public are noticing the fringes. The subject matter, which unfortunately, because we're in the parliament, the subject matter are, are the people who govern us and the people who contest ideas in the public space as politicians. The subject matter has to change their behaviour to be able to give the journalists a chance to restore respect in journalists. Uh, I think the idea that journalists could act alone, I mean, I do kind of like the idea of a ban on politics for a week on the ABC, but that's uh, it's probably not going to happen. <laughs> I do like the idea, but um, I reiterate it obviously for the viewer because I do think it's a good idea. 
But I think the idea that, that journalists could somehow pitch directly to the people. See, I think this is, this is uh, where a lot of these traps, these sort of sticky digital tra traps occur. The impression that you get instant response, instant validation from people you've never met tells you, seems to tell you that you're okay. <laughs> But I think that that's the worst possible way to, um, to function. So as a, you know, I've, I've ruled as an author, most authors would like to have their manuscripts published without an editor. In fact, that's the worst thing an author could do. Absolutely the worst thing an author could do is to rush a manuscript through. The first reader, the first test is the editor, and the editor's not going to put their name on it, so you don't have to worry about the editor's ego. The editor's trying to help the manuscript flow. And of course, after you've put these things out, even if they're well edited, you've still, still got six or seven other ideas you wished you'd put into the thing. So going to the other side of the story, which is just basically pitching for love from the public as a journal, without a contest or without an editor, is probably the worst. Um, I know you weren't suggesting that, but I'm, but I'm, just, following, I'm just following some of these thoughts through. Thank you. It just remains for me to uh, invite you all to join me in thanking our special guest presenter for today, George Megalogenis. Thank you. Thank you.